Let me introduce you to Dr. Momani Makaya. Makaya. Dr. Momani is a consultant obstetrician at Chakaranda Maternity. He holds a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from the University of Nairobi, a Bachelor of Endoscopy from the European Academy of Gynecological Sur Surgery, and Masters in Medicine um, uh, from the University of Wit Watersrand. I hope I've got that right in South Africa. He's also a fellow of the obstetricians and gynecologists of South Africa, FCOG, and a licentiate of the Medical Council of Canada. Uh, Dr. Makaya is a seasoned educator, having taught in both local and, you know, and international universities. Over to you, Dr. Mamani. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And good I don't know if it's afternoon for everybody uh, with us, but it's uh, yeah. So welcome to the presentation, and uh, I'm just going to be giving a brief um, talk on on uh, gestational diabetes. Um, I'll, the acronym goes by uh, GDM. So just as a, as an introduction, there is, there is a high prevalence. Of, um, of diabetes globally, high prevalence of that. Um, previously in the developing world, Kenya included, I'm sure most of the developing world, we had lower rates uh, than in the, de in the developed world. But we've noticed that uh, this, these rates are increasing, in fact, more markedly in the developing world. Um, just to give you some rough statistics from WHO in the 1980s, we had about 100 million cases of diabetes globally. Now we have about 400 million. Um, uh, but uh, because of this increase uh, in, in incidence, it has become quite, um, quite important that uh, we, we identify and manage uh, high blood sugar or hyperglycemia. So when it is detected during pregnancy, um, hyperglycemia or high blood sugar detected during pregnancy, is associated with an increased risk um, for adverse pregnancy outcomes. Uh, the most common risks we know are prematurity, macrosomia, which is big babies, um, preeclampsia, which is a, a blood pressure complication during pregnancy, and even stillbirth. Next. Um, so according to the World Health Organization guidelines, um, hyperglycemia first detected at any time during pregnancy should be classified into one of the two categories, either diabetes in pregnancy, so that's diabetes mellitus in pregnancy, or gestational diabetes uh, mellitus. Um, so this is a bit uh, of a departure from previous definitions of gestational diabetes, which included both categories in the same umbrella. Um, and uh, of course, uh, obviously they are not exactly the same presentation. So that umbrella, one umbrella definition was considered to be a bit too wide because there's a bit of a difference in the management of uh, those two conditions. So right now we have either diabetes in pregnancy or gestational diabetes mellitus. So gestational diabetes mellitus, uh, we will be focusing on the topic of today, is defined as glucose intolerance, which is... Uh, either first recognized in pregnancy or which starts in pregnancy. So for some people, they've measured their sugars prior to pregnancy. And if they find that they have glucose intolerance or high blood sugar during pregnancy, this would be gestational diabetes mellitus or if it's just first recognized and it was never known to be there before. So it accounts for majority of the cases of hyperglycemia in pregnancy approximately 90% of patients with high sugars in pregnancy blood sugars would be the gestational diabetes uh, category. Pre-existing type two diabetes um, accounts for the next uh, significant proportion, but it's much less, uh, it's about 8%. And pre-existing type one diabetes is at least prevalent about you know, 2% or so. And uh, we've noticed that women with uh, 
impaired glucose tolerance before pregnancy. Um, so those who are pre-diabetic, for example, they have a very high risk of developing gestational diabetes once they do fall pregnant. However, gestational diabetes, and this is why it's being distinguished from diabetes in pregnancy, tends to have a rapid reduction of the blood sugar after pregnancy ends. Um, let's go back. So why does gestational, uh, next slide. Why does gestational diabetes occur? Next slide, please. Go back. Uh, so next. Uh, next again. Yes. So we are we are we are talking about why do people uh, end up developing gestational diabetes? The exact pathology is not known. Um, however, there's a significant contribution to the development of this condition from insulin resistance. So resistance tends to happen in pregnancy um, because it is thought of the hormones that elevate during pregnancy, uh, most especially human placental lactogen, cortisol, estrogen. These are pregnancy-associated hormones. So as they rise during pregnancy, they tend to disrupt the usual action of insulin on the receptor and thus making it less effective. So that situation is known as insulin resistance. So usually the pancreas in the body will respond uh, by secreting more insulin, right? Because it's not working as well, will produce more of it, sometimes up to three times as much. Sometimes this uh, process does not actually according to, uh, to, to, to how we've described. And then in this case, of course, because the insulin is not working as well, the blood glucose will rise, and then we have this gestational diabetes uh, resulting. Next. So according to the WHO, um, remember we said hyperglycemia in pregnancy can either be um, gestational diabetes or diabetes per se in, pre in pregnancy. So the latest guidelines were developed in 2000. Six. And for the diagnosis of diabetes in pregnancy, any one of one or more following criteria, um, if, if any of the are, are met, that would be diagnostic of diabetes uh, in pregnancy. So the first is a plasma glucose of seven or above, seven moles per liter or above, uh, a two hour plasma glucose of 0.1 millimoles per liter or above following a 75 standard 75 gram uh, glucose load or um, random plasma glucose of 11.1 or above in the presence of diabetic symptoms. So if the patient is complaining of, you know, increased thirst, urination, and you do a random plasma, um, which is 11.1 or above, that would be diabetes agency. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a bit different from gestational diabetes. Uh, so WHO uh, states, according to their recommendation, that the diagnosis of uh, GDM uh, or the gestational diabetes mellitus are probably referred to it as GDM as we continue. Um, so any of the following categories would meet that threshold of diagnosis. So a fasting plasma glucose of uh, 5.1 to 6.9 millimoles per liter. Remember, once we get to seven, that's diabetes. Right? Um, there's an extra category here, WHO included for gestational diabetes mellitus, and that is a one hour plasma glucose of 10.0 uh, millimoles per liter or above, following a 75 gram oral glucose load. Okay, uh, so we should remember that is not uh, a one hour glucose is not a standardized way of diagnosing diabetes in pregnancy, but for gestation diabetes mellitus, it's a criteria for making that uh, diagnosis. And lastly, a two hour plasma glucose of between 8.5 to 11.0 millimoles um, per liter 
um, following a standardized 75 gram glucose load would meet the criteria of gestational diabetes mellitus. Above 11, again, that becomes diabetes in pregnancy. So there's a bit of a distinction there, and it's good to, to, to note those uh, cutoffs. Next slide. What about glucose in the urine or glycosuria? So um, occasionally, of course, for those who work in the antenatal clinic, we have seen in occasional patient samples glucose in urine. Is this problematic? Is it not problematic? Well, it depends. So why might glucose appear in the urine during pregnancy? This is because of an increased filtration by the kidneys of glucose, right? So it will filter the glucose from the blood. Usually it's able to reabsorb when someone's not pregnant all the glucose back. So glucose should not be filtered into the urine. In pregnancy, the filtration capacity exceeds the reabsorption capacity. And sometimes you find glucose being present in the urine. So it's not always indicative of a problem. However, the red flags uh, when you have glycosuria or glucose in urine include when you have it when someone is in a fasting state. Um, that could be necessitating further investigation or before the 20th week of pregnancy, because by then we know that uh, the insulin resistance has not really kicked in um, and the GFR has not changed too much. So if, if, if glycosuria or you, glucose in urine appears before 20 weeks, might need another look investigation, or if it happens twice or more after the second half of pregnancy, which is 20 weeks or later. So in case uh, someone is maybe suspecting that uh, the glycosuria could be indicative of uh, gestational diabetes, we should, that should necessitate a diagnostic test, which is the oral glucose tolerance test, OGTT, which can be done later. So um, who is at risk of developing gestational diabetes mellitus? We need to know who are the risks, of, uh, what the risk factors are, because of course not every, pre not every pregnant uh, mother will develop gestational diabetes. So the risk factors, the common ones that we know that everybody should uh, um, have at the back of their mind is being overweight, overweight or obesity, having a, especially a BMI of above 30 kilos per meter squared increases the risk of GDM. A family history of diabetes, relatives like first degree relatives, parents, siblings, a previous history of gestational diabetes. So if someone has been pregnant before they had gestational diabetes, the next pregnancy, they tend to have a high risk of that recurring. Um, a previous birth of uh, an infant weighing four kilos or above is a risk factor for the next pregnancy. Unexplained stillbirth. So stillbirths that um, the cause is not known or unexplained fetal malformation. Uh, you also have, for those patients, if they've had such a history, then that's a higher risk for GDM. Those above 25 years of age, those who've had impaired glucose tolerance or pre-diabetic, they've been diagnosed as being pre-diabetic before pregnancy, and of course, some medical conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, pre-pregnancy can lead to an increased risk of developing gestational diabetes mellitus. Um, so based on that, who should we test? Because if we've identified the risk factors, who should we test? So number one, the testing should be done between 24 weeks to 28 weeks of gestation. Um, and there are two protocols that are utilized um, globally. There's the first one, which is the universal screening. Um, so everybody gets a test for in the universal screening. Every pregnant mother gets it, uh, screened or assessed um, to see if they have gestational diabetes mellitus. Um, most other places don't do it. However, Jacaranda, um, we, we also, because we've been uh, fortunate enough to have the support, we also do um, utilize the universal screening. However, um, targeted screening is the other second option. Um, so this one would be based on the risk factor. Okay? So this is what most jurisdictions globally, uh, that's the approach they use, targeted screening. Maybe it's logistically more feasible and maybe cost-wise as well. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that as well. 
So if one is to approach the targeted screening um, or the targeted testing, this would be, you'd want to identify the women who are at a higher risk of developing gestational diabetes and test those. And if they're not um, high risk, don't test. So you need to remember the risk factors that we just mentioned in this slide. I'll just repeat some of them. Previous macrosomia, previous stillbirth, a history of diabetes in the family, um, any medical issues like polycystic ovarian, uh, yeah. patients have, have that type of history, then they're set aside for, for um, Even if someone is diagnosed with gestational diabetes, we need to remember that uh, even if we say that it uh, resolves post pregnancy, some patients may go on to develop uh, overt diabetes and they should be again screened after delivery six to 13 weeks later. Okay. So why are we screening? Why are we talking about risk factors? Does it improve pregnancy outcome? Uh, does the treatment of GDM improve pregnancy outcomes? The answer is yes. Um, treatment results in a statistically significant decrease in a number of complications, right? Um, the most common decrease when you treat is macrosomia or large babies. Large babies usually tend to have more problems um, during childbirth and a little bit after delivery. So when we treat uh, high blood sugars or hyperglycemia or gestational diabetes, we reduce that risk. We reduce shoulder dystocia, which is a complication during delivery um, where the fetus uh, gets stuck and can actually lead to nerve damage or even um, the, 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 the fetus dying. Preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders are greatly reduced when we treat GDM. Um, and also there's a reduction in uh, some other complications which I've listed there. Caesarean section rate goes down. Perinatal mortality, which is mortality of either the mother, the, the baby goes down and you treat GDM versus when you don't treat. Birth trauma goes down. Um, so there's definitely um, virtue in identifying and treating these patients to reduce overall complications. Right? And conversely, um, the risks of poorly managed or undiagnosed gestational diabetes, uh, I've just listed uh, a number of them. Um, of course, you can see this affects the overall um, health outlook of both mother and uh, baby. So there's an increased risk of miscarriages, stillbirths, when we don't manage high, high sugars in pregnancy or GDM, puerperal sepsis, which is infection, they have higher increased rates of that because of the high sugars. There's an increased risk of birth defects or growth restriction of the fetus. Um, there's an increased risk of prematurity. So sometimes you have to deliver babies early because of complications arising in pregnancy because of the high blood sugar that causes prematurity risk to go up. Respiratory distress in the neonate, macrosomia we've already mentioned, um, polycythemia, which is increased production of fetal erythropoietin. This is, comes in association with the hyperglycemic state of the fetus, okay? Um, metabolic syndrome in the fetus goes up, as well as neurocognitive development disorders like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in the newborn and also cardiovascular risks of that neonate or newborn later in life goes up when the mother had gestational diabetes, which was not properly managed. So as you can see, there's quite a number of complications that can occur. And uh, our aim is to reduce them by treating this condition, identifying it and treating it. Next. So how do we, what does the treatment entail? The management of the GDM. So of course, the best time to manage any condition generally that is associated with pregnancy is preconception before the pregnancy happens. As regards to um, gestational diabetes mellitus, maybe this may be applicable in a mother who previously had it before, is planning to get another baby in future. So preconception counseling comes in here, right? So we've seen from studies, we know from data that preconceptual sugar control has been most significantly linked to a reduction in birth defects and miscarriage. So it's even more important than controlling the sugars after pregnancy. 
pre-pregnancy, right? This can be achieved, achieving that sugar control can be achieved by lifestyle modifications, diet, exercise, optimizing one's body mass index, um, and also, as one is planning to fall pregnant preconceptually, um, taking conception up to about 12 weeks, this reduces significantly the risk of neural tube defects, um, which is a defect of the nervous system. And this is usually higher in people with high blood sugar in pregnancy. So giving that folic acid definitely helps in the outcome of the fetus. And we are targeting a glycylated hemoglobin or HbA1c of below 6.5 preconception. Okay, usually advising the mother to be to delay conception if her HbA1c or glycylated hemoglobin is high, because that would be associated with a higher risk of uh, of complications in pregnancy. So those are the parameters of what we would look at preconceptually, right? Antenatally, so the pregnancy is already ongoing. Um, what can we do uh, in our management, uh, in our arsenal of management? So in patients who've had a previous history of gestational diabetes, we advise early screening in the next pregnancy. So remember we said the testing usually happens 24 to 28 weeks at that gestational age. In patients who've had it before, we want to test them in the first trimester just to catch it early if it is there and start treatment earlier if it is there. Of course, if it's normal, we still test again at the usual interval of 24 to 28 weeks, right? And for those who are diagnosed um, from the screening, nutritional advice is paramount. All women need to be referred to a dietitian once the diagnosis is made. Um, what is the dietitian going to advise them on? Well, of course, to make a meal plan, but the main thing is to focus on you taking low glycemic index foods that usually maintain the, the blood glucose, does not spike it too much. Um, also, as part of the management, before we move to medication, is advising on exercise, moderate exercises. Uh, that tends to stabilize the blood sugar. Uh, not strenuous activity, just maybe walking for 30 minutes is enough. And then all these mothers usually need to be educated on self-monitoring of their blood glucose. So once the diagnosis is made, it doesn't end there. We have to train this mother, how are you going to check your blood glucose at home? So they need to be um, taught uh, on self-monitoring uh, of their sugars. And the targets we use are the same for diabetes in pregnancy and gestational diabetes. Next. Um, metformin, so this is a sugar, blood sugar lowering drug. Uh, the threshold to use it in gestational diabetes is low. So usually we, we, we recommend adding metformin if the blood glucose targets have not been achieved within one to two weeks of diagnosis. So usually you start by diet, exercise, modify your meal. The, the mother is testing her sugars daily. If within one to two weeks, our sugars are not optimal, metformin is recommended, right? Um, how do the mothers test for the blood uh, glucose levels? Usually it's a fasting uh, test and a one hour postprandial test, okay? So if metformin is either not uh, applicable in this mother, if it's contraindicated or she can't use it, or there's control of the blood sugar, we add on insulin as well. And of course, the blood sugar monitoring still needs to be done. The intervals are a bit more often with insulin because of the risk of hypoglycemia. So the regimen is usually a fasting uh, blood glucose test pre-meal so that someone can know how much insulin to, 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 to estimate to give one hour post-meal and bedtime to avoid, of course, hypoglycemia at night. And the targets we are looking for, for our plasma glucose or blood glucose, we're looking for, when we are managing gestational diabetes mellitus, uh, we are aiming for a fasting sugar of below 5.1. That's WHO cutoff for 5.6 if they're using the NICE guidelines, right? 5.1 to 5.6 below that fasting levels. A one hour postprandial, that's one hour after a meal of below 7.8 millimoles per liter for two hours postprandial level. So if she either checks one hour later or two hours later, can be either or. 
of uh, 6.4 millimoles per liter. So you want the levels below that. to Say you're maintaining the sugar within optimal levels, right? Uh, remember patients who are on insulin can't lower their blood glucose too low. So they should always try and keep it between above four millimoles per liter um, to avoid hypoglycemia. And uh, a lot of people recommend uh, measurement of glycylated hemoglobin. Well, that should be done in select cases. It shouldn't be done routinely, especially in the second and third trimester. We should more rely on daily testing. What about ultrasound? Um, ultrasound is very valuable in uh, management of, uh, of mothers with gestational diabetes mellitus. Uh, usually the first ultrasound is 20 weeks to detect for malformations, 20 to 24 weeks. And then we recommend doing a four weekly scan, four weekly ultrasound to just measure the fetal growth. Remember we said there's a risk of maybe high macrosomia or excess fluid, amniotic fluid. So four weekly ultrasound measurement to just monitor how the fetus is growing and the amount of fluid around the fetus is usually recommended. Routine umbilical ultra dopplers, non stress testing, routine call profile, which is a form of uh, more detailed ultrasound, is not usually supported routinely, right? For all the uh, gestational diabetic patients, it's not seen that it produces any benefit, right? Unless there's a risk for fetal growth restriction or there's a risk of placental insufficiency, then you can say for such a patient, I want to do further testing, right? Um, now going on to, that was on the, the antenatal period, going on to uh, the delivery plan, right, for these mothers. Um, this should have already been discussed and decided on in the antenatal period. However, we have some pointers to note. Delivery of gestational diabetic mothers should happen at 39 weeks or prior, right? Um, usually there's no reason to extend the pregnancy beyond 39 weeks. 38 weeks actually for pre-existing or uh, diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy, either type one, or type two, the target should be no later than 38 weeks of pregnancy. The reason is because the, the risk of uh, continuing the pregnancy is higher uh, than whatever benefit would be derived by reaching up to term of 40 weeks. So the mother needs to be, uh, of course, uh, counseled on the need for induction because usually labor is not started by then or if they're not uh, optimal for induction, a cesarean section uh, usually is planned. Um, these are our targets when we have optimized this patient uh, during the antenatal period. However, mothers can be de delivered earlier than these targets if they have any complications during the pregnancy. Most commonly, if they have things like growth restriction of the fetus, or whatever, maybe end organ uh, damage is happening, it, we might deliver those mothers earlier, right? And we do know that uh, just having gestational diabetes mellitus or diabetes in pregnancy should not be a contraindication to trying to deliver normally um, after a cesarean section, unless of course macrosomia, which is a big baby, unless that is diagnosed. And while we're talking about macrosomia, a lot of times it's diagnosed on ultrasound. Um, it's a common complication in hyperglycemic states. So if on ultrasound, a mother has uh, been diagnosed having a macrosomic fetus, she needs to be counseled on the risks versus the benefits of either vaginal delivery or doing a planned cesarean section, okay? Um, neonatal facilities need to be available uh, during delivery of this mother's gestational because uh, they, people need to be um, prepared for any neonatal complications. Commonly what we have is respiratory distress syndrome, neonatal jaundice, so those need to be adequately managed. The facility should have that. Um, immediately post-delivery, gestational diabetic mothers should stop glucose-lowering therapy. If they were taking it, they should stop because remember we said that the gestational diabetes tends to normalize after delivery. Right? However, we should uh, schedule them for a fasting uh, plasma glucose assessment or a standardized oral glucose tolerance test six to 13 weeks after delivery, 
just to exclude any ongoing diabetic state that they may be having. Um, in substitute of a fasting plasma glucose, we can also offer a glycylated hemoglobin test at about 30 weeks postpartum, just to rule out you know, ongoing uh, di diabetes, okay? So our targets of uh, glycylated hemoglobin should be below 5.7%. Um, impaired glucose tolerance is anywhere between 5.7 to 6.4%, and diabetes would be associated with a glycylated hemoglobin of above 6.4. On, now this is still on delivery, touching on uh, the effects of the newborn. So one of the most common complications is neonatal hypoglycemia, okay? So in facilities that are delivering mothers, of course, with gestational diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy, uh, those facilities usually need to, you know, have a standardized way of detecting and managing um, neonatal hypo hypoglycemia. So usually there should be a protocol in place that everybody can refer to. Um, they should be validated testing equipment for neonates, right? For neonates to either a ward-based uh, glucose electrode or lab um, uh, lab analysis equipment to um, check for neonatal uh, glucose levels. And uh, because we're trying to avoid the hypoglycemia in the neonate, we should initiate breastfeeding science within 30 minutes, actually it should be as soon as possible after delivery and maintain that breastfeeding every two to three hours just to avoid hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic state in the neonate. Um, never be shy to consider giving intravenous glucose or intravenous dextrose to the newborn if um, there's repetitive two consecutive readings of uh, below two millimoles per liter, despite breastfeeding, um, just as hypoglycemic, we should consider giving IV dextrose or any neonate showing clinical hypoglycemia to confirm by doing a blood test, um, it's always appropriate to, to add on intravenous glucose to avoid neonatal problems. Um, these are my references that I used to prepare my presentation, the WHO and the NICE guidelines, as well as uh, the comprehensive care manual uh, that is used by the Next. And I believe that's it. Thank you for your patience and uh, Yep, that's the end of uh, the presentation. I can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Mukaya, for the awesome presentation. Very, very ex explanatory. It was wonderful. Thank you. Okay.